right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I have a very special guest this evening, the wonderful and very talented Jamie Hanshaw. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, um, it's been really wonderful being able to form a bit. I, I may go out on a limb here, but a friendship with you and Jay, you know, the last few uh, couple months, really, his, his couple events, we were just at a wedding there in Franklin. And so, um, you know, it's been great forming a relationship and, and being friends with you guys and hanging out. And when we were in Orlando, I was finally able to see your full presentation that you do at Jay's, at Jay's in-person events. And it was really, really good. And so I told you, like, right after, I was like, Jamie, hey, will you come on? You think maybe we can do I don't want to give you, you know, I don't want you to give everything away because some of the stuff you guys want to keep under wraps. But could you come in and talk about it? And so that's what we're going to get into tonight is really dealing with some of your research in your book, Hollywood, Hollywood Mind Control. But looking at what I thought was so interesting is the Babylonian and the sort of ancient pagan roots to all this stuff. So um, before we get into your research and your work, uh, I know the major vast majority of the people here already know who you are, but maybe you can introduce yourself, your background, spiritual background maybe, and then how you got interested in conspiracy theories and maybe how that eventually led to Christ and, and who you are today. Okay. Um, my background is I was raised in a Baptist church. I went to private school um, until I was homeschooled. So we were very um, <clears throat> on the cutting edge of different uh, ways of dealing with issues. My parents, or my mom especially, was always very well um, educated and read. And she was a sort of social justice warrior before that became uh, ambiguous kind of term, um, but I remember her uh, being very anti A B O R T I O N mm. in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, we she would go and like picket Planned Parenthoods and things like that. Uh, she would write letters to the editor about curriculums in school that were um, inappropriate, sex eds and stuff like that. So even in the nineties, they were sort of the backlash to what would you call liberalism or these right. things creeping into our culture. So I kind of always grew up with that um, in my family. They're also very creative, very artistic. So uh, divergent types of personality. <laughs> Mixed bag, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so I was homeschooled. So I was allowed to pretty much pursue whatever I was interested in. I did have some kind of mail-in curriculum. At first it was VHS tapes and then it was just workbooks. But um, very soon I just kind of didn't do any of that. And I would just ride my bike to the library and check out all the books and just devour <laughs> books um, on things that I was interested in. So I was very autodidactic in that way, like self-taught uh, music and art and... And what um, were some of the things that young Jamie was interested in? Uh, very much music and singing. So I was, um, if I could have been anything, I would have been like a pop star. Like a Mar <laughs> Mariah Carey well, that, that goes hand in hand then with some of your research, right? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's why I have a soft spot for those girls. Um, I went to, when I was done with homeschooling, I went to a place where you could test out and get like a diploma mm -hmm. for gifted kids. Ooh. Not that I was ever deemed that way, but I just heard of this place where, oh, you can take this test and get a, a diploma. So I did that and I was 16 and I started going to college at 16, the community college where you could, you know, you were legally allowed to take classes if you had, you know, certain criteria is the diploma and the transportation and stuff. So I, I went, started going to college at 16 years old and I really enjoyed community college because it was kind of a mix of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you had older people, you had younger people, you had like people who are trying to restart their life. And so it was just kind of a, a fun environment, n not as much pressure as a university. Right. And also where I could continue to just study things that I was interested in. Yeah, explore your own interests. Yeah. 
So I did that for about four years. I didn't get any type of degree because I didn't follow any kind of like lesson plan. Right. But I took a lot of music classes. I took a lot of art, acting, um, public speaking, like creative arts type Mm -hmm. things. Uh, And then let's see. So all of this time I was pretty much involved in church. I sang in the choir. I did all of the um, church band. When we switched to a more like progressive church, I was in the band, like playing the keyboards. Okay. You're in the electric keyboard. Somebody else is on the electric drum set. Oh yeah. (laughs) Uh, My partner was the song leader and the guitarist and my dad was in the band. So it was a fun time. And then I just kind of got deeper into the conspiracy aspect in a way that not a lot of people were going to follow me because this was um maybe in like 2004 let's oh, okay say. so this is early after 9-11 i'm that was probably a catalyst to maybe question a few things oh yeah so i was only like 20 or so when i saw that but when i saw that i was like there's no way even the f- official story to a teen like someone who's very young i'm like this is ridiculous <laughs> yeah right, right. <laughs> and <clears throat> everyone around me is like how can you say that this you know and there was no 9 11 truth there was no uh, documentaries yet when it just happened but i had that on my mind i was just like whatever they're telling us this is not true because when i was younger my mom used to rent these videos like about the clinton family oh um like how you know, they unalive people. <laughs> yes. I, there seems to be a bit of a weird phenomenon that surrounds that family. Right. Uh, so these were early or like in the 90s or like uh, FEMA camps. So people would Ooh, get yeah. their camcorders out and like uh, get footage of FEMA camps. And then we would watch that and like, what is this for? And why, why are they building all of these facilities for like massive lockdowns? Right. Then that that happened, and then I saw that movie Loose Change like a couple years after Mm, mm 9-11. Do you remember that one? Yep. And then I saw that movie Zeitgeist, and that really put me in a kind of a tailspin because that has three parts. Do you remember that classic, right? Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. And at that time, the Zeitgeist part, I was already aware of the Federal Reserve, but it really like sort of – emphasize my astro theology at the time so i was that guy that was like dude jesus don't you know christianity is a solar religion they worship on sunday you know all that stuff basically everything that 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 documentary says yeah so i bought that hook line and sinker because i was searching you know i was always like trying to learn more because in i guess one of my core beliefs as a child or something is like if you're smart enough you don't have to suffer like you can think your way out of any type of bad thing that would happen to you if if you just have enough knowledge <laughs> right right, <laughs> right? <laughs> um so i'm like i can make my life really easy by being smart and reading lots of books and being educated and you know uh then you get deeper into things like the zeitgeist and you're like well this must be it because the the church that i'm going to now it doesn't really feed me spiritually right it was just like a pop-up uh, non-denominational rock band worship, praise and worship kind of church. Right. And so there's no mysticism in that. There's no like food in that environment. And especially for me, who was also like trying to introduce early conspiracy theories to friends and family. I mean, come on, they right. don't want to, you know, they're not having it. They don't want to talk about chemtrails. <laughs> yeah. Right. No one uh, wants to know about Federal Reserve or taxes or terrorists or not or Bush or you know like what else was going on? Um, well, the wars, uh, Enron, opiate crisis, yeah, Enron, military yeah. industrial complex, like just all of these things that are right under the surface that nobody like gets to that level back then. Right. Now it's a different world. It is, yeah, it is a different world. But there was no YouTube. There was no one to back me up. There was no. There was like a couple documentaries on the web. They're like, "Where did you learn that on the internet?" 
Yeah. Right? Because the internet wasn't a trusted source or anything back then mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. So it was like the Wild West. So I read a book by David Icke, and that put me in a deeper level of understanding. And then so I was like coming away from Christianity and going towards like just the amorphous love and light yep. brother right yep, yep. <laughs> like that was me i was at one point that was me too yeah i was reading this book the other day and then the back of it had a um advertisement for this little thing called handbook for the new paradigm mm. have you ever heard of that no i haven't oh that was going around everywhere back in the day like in 2005 in austin maybe 2007 ish but it was just this little book that's supposed to like change the world or whatever, but everyone was talking about Handbook for the New Paradigm. They were talking about um, Infinite Love and, and David Icke and like the the Matrix. And so I found myself, I was very lonely in my situation in California because I didn't have anybody to talk to about this stuff. And I thought if I went to Austin, Texas, <laughs> I was like <laughs> the capital of conspiracy theorists, you know, because Alex Jones Absolutely. was there and some others. And so I had a brother who lived in Dallas and I went to stay with him while I like transitioned to from California to Austin in 2007, which was a really fun like place to be. It was on the cutting edge of like what's cool and what's hip and the conspiracy world and everything going on there. So I did that for a long time. I I was a religious. I wasn't like, I was just thinking that you could take from all of the religions and make something great. Right. Is that called perennialism or yeah, something? Basically, like, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, it, it's the <clears throat> smorgasbord of, of religion and spirituality, right? Yeah. And so I, you know, I would do yoga and I would, I, I never got serious about meditating, but I did find right. that yoga really helps balance your your moods and yep. your physical body and just like calm yep. I, I loved the the calmness and peace of the eastern right ways of thinking yep. zen and stuff like that because i'm just like a very and it was probably the mystical too that you're reaching out coming from that sort of baptist background you're talking about the sort of loss of christianity and you know, with it, with Eastern mysticism, you can be this weird sort of spiritual, not religious, but yet then also have access to mystical experiences at the exact same time. And so mm -hmm. it's so appealing. I mean, that was really me throughout the majority of my 20s. Yeah. <clears throat> and I also liked the vibrant um, colors. Yes. I wasn't green. used to that. The um, aesthetics of like Hinduism. I really loved. And so if you look behind you, you know, in Orthodox now yeah. that we have that uh, things to, I don't want to say trip out on, but right. it's, well, it's like that you yeah. meditate on them. Yes. And you have that mm -hmm. sensual pleasure, that aesthetic pleasure yeah. um, that I, I won't lie. When I was a non-Christian, the first, I've always said this, the first Orthodox church I went to was Holy Virgin Cathedral there in San Francisco with St. John of Shanghai. And oh, at wow. the time, I was dating a Ukrainian girl, and she really wasn't Christian, but she wanted to just go in and burn some candles. So I would go in there with her for the first time. And the beauty of the icons was, like, awe-inspiring. Now, again, I wasn't a Christian. I was very into psychedelics and perennialism, this basic worldview that we're talking about. But the aesthetics and the orderedness and then seeing the biblical stories, and because I grew up Methodist, I could still look at the iconography and know what was being displayed, and it was like wow, that mm -hmm. is phenomenal. And so it's not like I'm orthodox because we have icons and the aesthetics, but it's certainly an aspect when you go back to a sort of austere Protestant form of worship and there's like nothing on the walls and it's just everything's white and there's like one cross and it's like, well, where's like the aesthetics? Where's the beauty? Mm -hmm. And so for um, an artistic person like I was, I really liked the mandalas and I like yeah, uh, the yantras. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say about? <clears throat> colors, anyway. colors, aesthetics, uh, Eastern mysticism. You were yeah. somebody who's artistic. Is... Oh, yeah. And so like the type of people that I was hanging around um, 
we're very free spirited hippies um you know different all types of people and we found ourselves living in kansas in one point <laughs> and we were the type of people that we would let people stay with us if they didn't have a place to go oh, okay so our house was the house for you know couch surfers and ne'er-do-wells and just nice people <laughs> yeah. that didn't ha but they just you know couldn't get it together and i had several people like on my couch on my floor in the spare room everywhere and i was like kind of like you're swamping the boat here guys <laughs> and <laughs> these um christians came to my door and they wanted to invite me to church and i was like okay because i was always kind of like trying to get these guys to like do something <laughs> right you know? <laughs> well, well, yeah and, like if you're gonna stay you're gonna get on food stamps and you're gonna try and like improve your situation and i'm like maybe we could all go to church because i remembered that from my youth like yeah. there's stable people yes. in the world that you know have families and they have they can support themselves they have jobs they're called christians <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. and um so they, they came to my door and they're like would you come to our church i'm like yeah i'll bring all these guys to church and i said do you have like a food pantry or anything that they could pick from and like oh no 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 and i'm like okay well do you have any programs where like you can help them find jobs or like counseling for a draw you know just do you have anything uh valuable that's practical mm -hmm. from your organization and like mm, no not really nothing like that it's like well what are, what are you even doing like i'm a better christian than and that's what i'm thinking <laughs> yeah, in my head yeah. at that time like i'm doing the lord's work yeah at least you're, you're trying to bring all these people, people to christ i'm trying to just feed them and give them a place to like a roof over their head and they're like, well, we, there's nothing we can really do, but you can come. And I'm like, I'm not coming there. I already like I have the principles of loving your neighbor, so right. I don't need to like go to church. So that was one instance that just kind of kept me. And then, you know, the people that I was around and living with, every time I tried to get them to like look at a church, they hated it. And I'm, I can't blame them because, you know, when you walk in and it's just like all like, elderly people not no offense i love old people but like the entire church is like white-haired people that i, I the agree same. there's you you got to find people you can relate to right yeah so these hippies are not going to church <laughs> <laughs> and so this is just kind of like my path that you asked for like yeah. coming from church and then out of it right. being drawn out of it by um false information and like conspiracies couched in truth but then at the heart of it it's another lie like zeitgeist right you know because when you actually go and look at the sources that he is coming up with are bunk and stupid and you know right. jesus is not zeus and he's not horus and he's right. you know december 25th is not what he says it is and so it, it's very easily debunked now but back then i was like well if i've been lied to about like patriotism and i've been lied to about like what america is and what taxes are and blah 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 then this is probably a lie too right and, so and that's a perfect bridge into then the topic and the research because it's about establishing these sort of like plausible narratives because just like the zeitgeist mm -hmm. like you said as i matured in my own spirituality and like began to investigate some of the claims that I'd always make, like, again, the relationship between Osiris and Horus and Mithra and Christ and solar religions. And then you do kind of look into it and you're like, oh, yeah, Mithra has like this connection and this connection, but then all these don't work. Yeah, these don't work. But then, okay, Osiris has, yeah, this connection, this, but none of these work. So then you find, oh, well, shoot, that's not, they don't just match on one to one. Like these things are way more complicated. And but it's the plausibility of the narrative. And in the mm -hmm. same way, that's exactly what then Hollywood is all about. And so now combined into your journey, like now you're getting into conspiracy, conspiracy theories, been sort of on that journey, it sounded like for a few years. Um, what brought your interest then looking back at like Hollywood and, and then connecting with some of these ancient pagan rituals and formations? So first maybe in like 2006, I started watching Alex Jones and all sorts of 
first or second wave conspiracy guys like Jordan Maxwell. Oh my gosh, I was big into Jordan Maxwell and Michael Tessarian. Yeah. I listened to him too. He had a um, course that was five hundred dollars. <laughs> Do you remember that? I do. Yeah, I couldn't afford that. I but didn't I, afford I watched either. all his videos. I did too, because he had a bunch of free stuff. I would take notes, like at that time. Yeah. And I remember this is in, it's kind of embarrassing now, but I was watching the Jordan Maxwell stuff, and I was blown away. I, I had my I had both feet into Terrence McKenna, Alan Watts, that whole thing, psychedelics, and then I'm coming across the Jordan Maxwell stuff and all the wordplay. I bring that up to one of the uh, scholars of religion and I start going on and one that hit like Jordan Maxwell's like wordplay and this connects to that and that connects to this and this connects to that. Mm -hmm. And they just like look at me like, no, it doesn't. That's not what that means. And, and like that only works in, in English. And then they showed me like all the like the other language. Like, D what are you talking about? Like, who told you this? And then I was like, well, well, maybe English. And then in my eyes, well, language English is just a magical language, and this is like the web. This is what they're casting the spells with, and you sort of like try to rationalize this whole bubble where the conspiracy is sort of almost so large. Like if Jordan Maxwell was right, it's like everything is part of this massive, massive conspiracy to like entrap the human mm -hmm. mind. Um, and, the, and it's not tied to necessarily morality, which is uh, now I'm sure both of us, when we look back and look at the conspiracies and look at the state of the world, it is, it's totally a spiritual worldview, a spiritual battle, and it's mm -hmm. about morality. But sorry, I didn't mean to rant there, but the George Maxwell, huge part of my journey too. I was, I dove head first into all that stuff. Yeah, I remember um, Michael Sarian, I watched all his like tarot yes. DVD series. And I really wanted to meet him. And it's funny. Well, I emailed him because he was saying this stuff about there's giant bone. This is so goofy. He said there's giant bones hidden in different places in the world. And those are places that are always like protected from natural disasters and stuff like that. I was like, where are these giant bones? So I like emailed him. And this was way back in the day before like anybody blew up famous so he actually responded to me and you know i said where are the bones and he's like i'm not gonna tell you that <laughs> oh what, what the heck okay fine and then i met him in england one time and i was like hanging out with a group that was just listening to him talk because that's kind of how it's funny that these guys when they go to a conference they're finally validated right. in a world so they like get all of that, you know, celebrity energy. So he's just talking and all of these people are, are in a semicircle around listening to him. And I was there too. And then, you know, when it was my turn to like meet him or, you know, introduce myself, I started talking to him about all of this. I was talking about Disney, something Disney and like, oh, stream of consciousness of my discoveries that I had made. And he was like, wow, he was all impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, can you email me all of this information? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that because <laughs> he, he totally went to where the lion bones are. Yeah. I'm going to keep my information myself and I'll write a book of my own. That's so. hilarious. Yeah. So what we've come to the conclusion is, is that in spite of Michael Tassari, and that's why you wrote your research. <laughs> I wrote that to spite a lot of people because back then, if you didn't have a book, you were nobody. Like nobody knew what a podcast was. There was no YouTube yet. It was just right. Google video. Right. So what you would do is go to a, an access studio in Austin and make a, like a Wayne's World TV show about conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then upload them to Google video and then a couple, like maybe a year later, YouTube started, but you couldn't get any respect if you weren't published back right. then. Right. I was like, I gotta have a book. I gotta have a book. And I saw this magazine that was like a time magazine. It was a special edition, uh, about the Freemasons and it had a big compass and square on it. And I open it up and I'm looking through this thing and it's just, it's poorly written. There's nothing interesting in there. It's all giant blown up pictures. You know, the thing cost $15 for a magazine. Jeez. Yeah. Cause it was like a special, you know, still that was back in the day that, I mean, that's not, condition. that's not Biden inflation numbers. No. And I'm like, man, 
I've been to all these Mason temples. I've been to all these secret esoteric sites. I've read all of these books. Like, right. I could do my own and it'll look like this and it'll be even better. And that's how this book was born. Oh, and that's the one that if you want people to give people the skinny on, you don't p sell that one anymore, correct? I don't sell this one anymore because this was still when I was like under the impression that magic was neutral. Mm hmm. And it just depended on the user. Right. Yeah, the white, and that's a popular, I yeah. believed in the exact same thing, that there's white magic, gray magic, black magic. And this has to do with the intentionality of the magician. And so mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're using magic to help others, well, then that's white magic. If it's gray magic and it's a little mixture of your own will and others' will, and then black will is just the full-on, like, manifestation of your own will. Mm -hmm. So I... I put this book together and I did this cover like it's part my drawings and part pictures of places that I've been but I wanted to start with the children because I noticed oh. that that's where they get you mm -hmm. is from childhood so you've got two little kids here watching um, Disney Donald Duck I don't know if you've ever seen this cartoon um, it's called education for death uh -uh. education for uh, death so it was a part of Disney's propaganda campaign in the uh, World War II era. And if you Google like Disney on the front lines, uh, there a whole bunch of videos will come up about propaganda, about paying taxes, about like the creation of a Nazi, kind of weird non-Disney-ish stuff because they also oh. did training videos for the army. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So, and yeah. then you've got this like robot who's made of like an iPhone and iPad who's like enchanting the kids. <clears throat> it's a whole thing. Like, there's an exegesis about my art on the covers. I love of these it. Books, I love right? it. Um, and you've got like this sorcerer that looks like the Pope. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, give, it gives a real like Cardinal Vatican vibe. It was the Ratzinger Pope back then. Oh, okay. okay. Remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm like, I want this black sorcerer to look like you know, the Pope or whatever. And you've got like, so like black magic on one side and then nature on the other. And then this actually is from that church in New York city called St. John of the divine. Mm. I'm not um, familiar with it. Is there something it, particular it, about this church? Yeah. It's got so much weird. I can't remember what kind of church it is. It's like a, <sighs> it's an ecumenical and not Lutheran. Um, oh, key, Cathedral of St. John the Divine, New York City. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. What kind of church is that? It's, um, it's looks like Gothic Episcopal. style uh, Episcopal church. That's it. So one thing about that church, if you go there, um, it has these like columns that have prophetic things on them. And one of them was like, there's like a twin towers with smoke coming out of it and wow. all these weird things in the columns. So, this Episcopal, yeah, he just yelled it to me. So, this one, I put a lot of, like, Magic 101 in it, right? The pentagram and Mephistopheles oh, and yeah. Manly Hall. Do you remember that yes. story? Um, <clears throat> because I wanted people to recognize pop culture for what it was which is uh like a ritual working right magical spell nowadays you will call it um mass formation psychosis yes well let's just get into it because that was one of the things that i wanted to talk about so maybe even before we get into the specific of all the babylonian and the current hollywood stuff ritual is what unifies the past and the present and so ritual generally speaking just as a category as a religious study scholar is the development of sacred time sacred space so within rituals rituals are technically not belonging within traditional space and time and that's then it's like these ritualistic practices whether it be the ancient babylonian or, or rituals to iana or then current rituals to beyonce or Katy perry whatever speak a little bit to the ritualism the importance of ritual and how ritual ties everything we're going to dive into it ties everything together mm -hmm. what some occultists would call it would be math or um self-transformative psychodrama <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> in 
The occult is, I gave this example um, in Florida, but they say, if you want to be something, then just act like the thing. So if you decide I want to be a vampire, then start drinking blood, don't go out in the daytime, sleep in a coffin, wear black, don't eat garlic, do all the things classically that a vampire would. And over time, if you do this enough um, and make it ritual and habitual, then you will be a vampire. Right, right. And you can apply this to anything. You can apply this to being a magician or a god or uh, an animal, you know, whatever. But it's that thing that takes us, like you said, out of the here and now and the normal space and time and puts you in a different realm. And what they have you do in a magic ritual is like, let's say you want to invoke the god of war or Mars or something. So you want to get all red. You want to you have your candles red. You want to have like right. the symbols of Mars. You want to have the smells of Mars. You want to have the, the proper incense. So all of your five senses have to be attuned to this thing that you're trying to invoke or evoke. And liturgy is a little bit like that because it is, we say that it's outside space right. and time. Yeah. We're linking up with, um, the worship in heaven mm -hmm. that's happening at the same time. We're also out of space and time, um, and we are participating in the crucifixion, you know, mystical ideas like that. Right. But this can be applied in a, a wrong way. Right. Magical rituals, invoking spirits or evoking them. Right. Right. So I wanted to talk about art. And how that is used in magic. So I talk about like cave paintings in France and how setting an intention is sort of a magical act. Like you paint on the wall that you are going to um, hunt some deers or something and then you go out and hunt the deer. So that's an, a primitive idea of magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? and it's tied to even sigil magic, the idea that we can... So sigil is the idea that we look at the symbols we create and sort of can remanifest that reality through like a sort of symbolic uh, magical process. And so a lot of people who believe in sigil magic will point again to the cave paintings in France or whatnot and say, look, what they do, what the shamans do is they they sort of linguistically lay out the scenario that they want to have at play. They draw it on the cave wall and then they go participate in the hunt to sort mm -hmm. of manifest this thing to happen where people think, oh, maybe they're just depicting. And now the general consensus amongst others, no, they're, they're, they're describing what they want. It's an intentional process. And it's all about your will. So when right. you study magic, you're going to come across this, the true will, the divine will, the will of your higher self, yep. um, your guardian angel yeah. will. Yep. Cosmic like will that. is somehow we yeah. can know that too. So it's this idea of bending nature and the forces of nature, space and time, things like that, to your own ideas and right. what you want your will. And then so in this book, I was talking about like a sorcerer. I was trying to differentiate between a sorcerer and a magician, which in the occult world, there is definitely um, a demarcation there. But like so the sorcerer wants to impose his will on everyone else right um a magician will use his will but like if he feels like a resistance or if he feels bad or if he feels like he's stepping on someone's other person's will maybe he'll back off a little bit but a sorcerer is right. like going for it right? right like even to the point of mind control like physical control of your body right um so that's kind of what the first chapter of this rare book is about the one that you don't have right. um and i was also in a lot of like esther hicks Oh that? my gosh, yes. I did one on <laughs> spirit manifestation. Her and Bashar. Do you remember the guy who would be yeah. uh, Bashar? He'd be possessed by the alien and then he'd like sit there like this and. Yeah, I know people who would uh, go to see him and like sit in the circle all cross legged oh and wait for gosh. hours for Bashar to um, arrive in his body. So I was listen like listening to Esther Hicks and The Secret and quantum physics and all of this like half goofy stuff. Which now we make fun of, like, we call it the zone theory after this Tim and Eric skit. Do you know those comedians? Mm -mm. 
Okay, so look up Tim and Eric's zone theory and you will get the secret like roasted because it is so funny. They're like, you can be rich and famous now <laughs> and just give, giving you all of these crazy promises. If you just have gratitude and if you just live with uh, light and love in your heart, everything will work out. Oh, and I see it now, yeah. I'll check that out afterwards. <clears throat> yeah. Just, uh, you, you gotta, like, hook up with divine consciousness, man. And <laughs> yeah. All of these goofy ways of thinking. So, But there's truth in here because I was also talking about, like, how emotions mm -hmm. um, play a big part in manifesting things in physical reality right because you know these are real science quantifiable things vibrations yes um so i have stuff about imagination and magic and like do you remember the cymatics oh yes i've done videos on cymatics and logos yeah, yeah absolutely um, all magic, I said, seems to be a result of associations or changes in consciousness powered by emotions. So this is what the sorcerers, mm -hmm. what I was trying to say of like Babylon or Egypt, they're trying to uh, manipulate you using emotional techniques. Yes, right? and, and that has to do with the energy of emotion is fuel for the theurgic process. And, and a lot yeah. of these ain't. So when we look at Babylon here... They're anthropomorphizing human emotions and natural processes. That's part of what these ancient pagan traditions were doing. And so when they venerate maybe uh, the sexual energy as a goddess or whatever, well, then inflaming sexual energy is part of a process that unifies society and is part of a ritualistic phenomenon. And, and that's where I think it's tied even orthodoxy, like the other forms of Christianity, because they don't have this understanding of energies, it's like they can't like, bring answers to these problems that we're talking about re regarding these energies because i think when we look at hollywood and like you talked about the eternal goddess how <clears throat> they use Katy perry or beyonce or britney spears they're just different emanations of the sort of eternal goddess figure mm -hmm. and um the they're inflaming our sort of sexual lust and so we're made in the image of god we have divine energies as long as we participate with God, and we can lose that image of God when we sin. But by inflaming the sexual passions, they're getting, they're using our creative energies to basically move society and create things that move us towards this sort of ultimate demonic will. Exactly. And that's a secret of Freemasonry and stuff like that, that not a lot of people talk about, like their aprons and their... <clears throat> the white apron that they wear over their waist and everything and the G for the general principle. Some people are, will argue that the compass and square is actually like two pairs of legs and stuff like, and the G is whatever. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you're exactly right. So they manipulate us using our sexuality. And so when you study magic, you're going to go down the path where you find out that, a ritual is 10 times or 100 times more powerful if you add sex in it. Yes. And, and sex, right. yeah, and that's really this process. And even when you look at the occultism, historically speaking, you look at uh, all these different, uh, you look at like occult processes, or if you look at Eastern <clears throat> mysticism, look up tantric processes, and you're going to find then sexual rituals, and it's going to be tied to also the manifestation of your will and that you can have an intention engage in sex and it's all about then the orgasm itself is using that orgasmic energy that sort of sexual fecundity to then manifest your own desire and that's what they're trying they're trying to hijack and they see these as spiritual energies and it's also a type of child so it's like you know the mystery of oh, childbirth it's like the homunculus right it's like the magician yeah. creating like the little baby thing like the little hum hominid thing so it's harnessing the power of creation where you're supposed to be creating another man in the image of God, but you're using it to get wealth or summon demons or whatever you're right. going to be And doing. it's always a Frankenstein, right? It's all, it always ends mm -hmm. up a Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. So um, talk a lot about quantum physics because that was big back then, mm -hmm. like oh, the yeah. 2010. Oh, yeah, locality consciousness. Yeah. Um, let's see. I put... I don't know why I put the banishing ritual of the pentagram in this book. 
because <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, all, a lot of this stuff is really beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. And if I use it the right way, I never did like sex magic or anything like that. I'm just a nerd. I'm just a reader <laughs> in my head because I also was bringing in knowledge of conspiracies. Right. And knowledge that this stuff can be used to hurt people like Kabbalah. Right. Um, you know, you can use that in mind control very easily. Like Fritz Bremer talks about using the tree of life to place different personality altars. And they, they use these as frameworks for a system of personalities in a person. Right. So I'm like, if, if pedos and gross people are using this magic, I don't want to like mess with it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like I, I've never done a spell. I've never done like an incantation. I, I, but I know all of this stuff just by reading and, um, watching pop culture. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's funny and it's good that you did it, but what got me going is like what connected it all. Cause at the time I, I had watched Alex Jones, Bohemian Grove. I, at the same time, I'm really deep into psychedelics, which then like the whole Joe Rogan culture, I have one foot in that. So it's like, it's tied to the con the conspiracy angle and we didn't go to the moon and you know, Joe Rogan's talking about Bigfoot all the time. So it's like, it's all, it's all tied together. But then when I did sigil magic, and it worked like creating a symbol with an intention to manifest something. And then it works. And then you're like, wait, this stuff's real. And then it begins to unify all the conspiracy. And then it's like, wait, 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 wait. Then it's like it brings your mind to a point where you got to start asking way bigger questions about spirituality yeah. and this whole reality. Okay. That's the one thing I did do was draw sigils because I like art and I like drawing and I, I thought like what is that called chaos magic yeah chaos magic yeah um do you want to see yep. let me grab let's, it let's see your magical wow. whirlwind okay. <clears throat> guys smash that like for everybody here we got 171 people please smash that like hope everybody's enjoying your night god bless you all send in those super chats uh using the Streamlabs link preferably if you prefer to use YouTube, that's fine, too. We're going to get to all the Super Chats here in a bit. we still got a lot more content to dive into here. So we've already been going for 45 minutes. Feels like we just started. So, guys, smash that like. Hope everybody's doing well. <clears throat> God, my old art book here. <laughs> and... I couldn't afford at that time like any art supplies, so I had crayons. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so that's that why I so can't trippy. remember yeah. what it was for. But that's but exactly so that's exactly what I was trying to explain to people, like what a sigil is. Like you can't tell what exactly that image is. Like the the yeah. the, the consolidating of like letters into like just an amalgamation of like shapes and images, and now you you've basically what what they call concretizing taking a desire and making it now two-dimensional mm -hmm. so what you do is think of something that you want and you take all the vowels out yep and you make a like an artwork of the leftover letters so you can see maybe like a u a w not, i can't even yeah. remember what's for but so that was probably for love i bet you because it's like right um what else do i got i don't even know <laughs> these are these are straight yeah sigils this is stuff this that, is for can you guess what that would have been for uh the goddess i mean mother no. earth money Look oh money oh yes. i see it at the bottom yeah. <laughs> see that's the can one that i did and it worked what i needed and at that's that what time. scared the crap out of me i was like wait i just like asked for money and it just came like a few days later yeah. so there's one and then you you see these shapes um traveling around so i kind of tried to make that look like you know like a compass and square oh yeah it definitely does david yeah. atkinson says don't look straight at him he'll make you want to send in a super chat <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> yes please i don't know what that was for but it was something those are cool um oh, that's oh like, remember these things the merkabas yeah that's like gamma uh the um yeah the merkaba the uh I have little notes in here, 19 degrees, 19.47 degrees. That has something to do with esoteric, whatever. Merkaba, chariot vehicle, cherubim. Oh, there it is. There's the Kabbalistic tree. 
Yeah. This is some kind of... That looks like the hammer and sickle or something. Is that it's... your communist stage? No, it's some <laughs> kind of angle. Magical angle degrees. I don't I got a bunch of these. What? Metatron's cube? Oh, yep. Metatron's cube. <laughs> I can guess what that is. Yeah. Because <laughs> this goes along with it. And, of course, I did all of the acid and mushrooms mm -hmm. and DMT and whatever else the cool kids were doing at the time. Right. Um, I don't know. So how, um, like all this sigil magic and magic generally speaking, um, can you speak a little bit then to like, what are the aspects of these ancient, like, like Babylon, for example, that you see Hollywood specifically beginning to sort of pull from, um, because you, I, you know, you have a whole section explaining this for people, so that's why they need to go get their, your book, which they can get at Jay's website, right? You, you guys sell yeah. all your books over there, so go. Jay's over to analysis, you can get that one, Hollywood Mind Control, and um, this one called it's Part Two, with the princess and what, yeah. <clears throat> but if you want to keep talking about this one, it'd be really interesting for yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, if you want to keep going it. with that one, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, but you just asked me. Oh, okay. So Babylon and Egypt are like prototypes of evil evil civilizations right. that are just hell-bent like devil worship Corrupt, basically. basically full-blown worshiping their own passions right so it gets back to what you're talking about what's feeling the sort of magical force field mm -hmm. is the sort of people that are led by their passions and so christ we follow christ we're slaves of christ he's making sure we're not slaves then to these sort of magical networks in Babylon and Egypt, as you're saying, are sort of archetypes of this phenomenon. Yes. So these are the things that are against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're going to see um, Babylonian things and Egyptian things coming up a lot because they were very um, big strongholds for Satanism, basically, and magic. And so, and like you were saying, this stuff works, Yeah. but not for good. Right. You are communicating with demons and people are going to say they're aliens or, you know, angels or higher entities or whatever, like benevolent Pleiadians or something retarded like that. But it's just, you know, garden variety demons. Yeah, I think of it as like you start messing with the magic stuff. It's like all of a sudden like a fl there's a flickering of a light and demons are like moths. Like they can they start swarming. Because you're basically tapping and you're giving you're giving a sort of acknowledgement because you have you're made in the image and so you're using your will to sort of condone stepping into these arenas where then they are have free game to interact with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I told a funny story about. Well, let, let's not talk about that. <laughs> uh, let's see what else here. Transcendental magic by Elifus Levi. Oh. <laughs> and then, um, oh, here's, <clears throat> so I'm giving like little snippets of things about Pythagoreanism. Can you oh, see that? Okay, yeah, yeah. And how the pentagram Oh, and is... you got the Donald Duck. Yeah, because that's always a great episode. I remember when I was into magic, also showing people that because that, they're breaking down sacred geometry there. Mm-hmm. And showing you it was a secret society. Right. So in, in my talk, um, I kind of talk about how actors and plays and drama and uh, the history of theater is about invoking gods right. into yourself right. to be worshipped right. on the stage. Right. And then, oh, okay, so here's Sorcerers and Robots is another, like, chapter I put in there. Oh, tell me a little bit about that one. Because we were talking about the black magicians and sorcerers, how they are hell-bent on imposing their will. And so a robot is going to be something that is sacred to them because it's made in the image of God, but it's something that they can control. Mm. And that's something that Anton LaVey was very um, interested in. And I talk about that in my talk about him uh, thinking that sex bots and robotic humanoids and synthetic relationships were going to be the next step in evolution. Right. And that it would be bigger than Ford Motors, he thought. And that he had an entire 
den in his house like in the basement he built up a bar that was full of mannequins that he would put in different poses like they were patrons at the bar and he called it his den of iniquity and he would just like hang out there all the time because he preferred um synthetic companionship and he thought that a lot of people in the future would too which is pretty spot on right and i think that's totally tied to this sort of magical web right so if they're trying to control us through our energies and our emotions and the sexual energy is the strongest by getting humanity to fornicate with like machines and robots shows that they have basically fully controlled your sexual urges like you are fully under the auspices of this sort of structure because if they can control sex which they now want all artificial wombs so they want to control all reproduction across the board mm -hmm. this is pure De demonic i mean as we see it but i used to think about this a lot like so they've got guys attracted to cartoons like japanese oh, i had no idea this was that fun that was that big like these guys really do like are sexually attracted to like these big boob like anime things it's crazy or like ponies or like you know shows for little girls what they're oh yeah you know about bronies right what the guys Bronies? Yeah. You never heard about bronies? No. Come on. Like what is the guys that? who like My Little Ponies and they they sexualize the the ponies and they cut out the No, plushy I had no idea there was like flashlights in them and like oh come on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. So even before like the first sex bots there was bronies and there was anime and there was like, you know, pillow humping and and there was like corn on the computer. So if you're thinking about this in a magical context and that like cuz you're when you start reading in that world your focus shifts and you're like what about energies because energies are really important you know like the energy that I'm giving out or the energy right. that you're giving to me or the energy I'm giving to this thing. So think about the energy that you're giving to your computer. Right. When you're watching corn and you're touching it you're like touching your little mouse or you're like touching your laptop or your PC or whatever, you're touching yourself and it gets everywhere. And they tell you at magic, like these secretions are super charged. Yes. With magic powers. Yes. And that, that is a basis. I've told this before, but I'll tell you, uh, there was at the PhD program I was in when I was back in Berkeley, one of the students was a master's student and it was a transgender female. So it's a female biological that as identifying as a man, but then sexually identifies as a lesbian because he only likes girls, but it's a, she, I, I brought that up. People were very angry at me. <laughs> I was like, I'm confused. Anyways. Yeah. I'm um, already confused. Yeah. She, he, the lesbian was also a priestess in a satanic temple there in the Bay area. And there was a theistic temple. So this isn't like, Anton LaVey says, oh, no, we're just atheists. This is a temple that literally says, no, we theistically worship Satan as the light bringer. And, and one, one time she mentioned how they do basically perform an inverted Catholic mass. And they do eat wafers with menstrual blood and feces and semen and stuff on them. And blood, you know, just... And, and they, she said, it's because we, there's no limit. And I've talked about this before. The point is to not have any limitation. And so there's nothing they won't t transgress. And so the fact that they'll do that and they're not disgusted by it in their mind shows they have power over you and me who would say, that's gross. Or I have morals or, or again, I'm a Christian. I don't do that. They'd say, yeah, exactly. And that's why you deserve to be dominated. That is the lesson of the checkerboard floor in masonry is that the mason or the magician is above duality of wrong and right mm, so they walk above point. that that's great point right? yeah, um that's a great <clears throat> point so it whenever i hear about the gnostic catholic mass and gross things like that it it's funny to me because satanism and satanic ideologies they don't have any creative powers because they're of darkness right right and so a satanic symbol is a pentagram inverted. Right. Because I, I don't think there's anything wrong with pentagrams 
necessarily. I think it's a beautiful symbol. Like I think it's a perfect, right. you know, it's a five point star. Historically, out of it's always represented man, right? Exactly. Like two, That's two why legs, I have arms ahead. Yeah. So what is that called? The uh... Agrippa's pentagram. The guy in the pentagram. Oh yeah, Agrippa. Yeah, Cornelius See? Agrippa. Yeah. So like when you turn it down. It's a man upside down. Yeah, and that's the point of the upside down pentagram is the inverted man. So evil is inversion of goodness. And it always makes me laugh. Like I think of that scene from Mean Girls where the the <laughs> blonde's like, why are you so obsessed with me? But it's like the Satanists are obsessed with Christians because they have to invert. Right. The they need us because we are the truth yeah. to for them to have their worldview. It's like, again, because they need us. We don't need them. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I did have a funny quote from Terrence McKenna. It says, oh, we are caged by our cultural programming. Culture is a mass hallucination. And when you step outside of the mass hallucination, you see it for what it's worth. So these are like the deep thoughts that I thought I was including in right. my book on magic because I thought Terrence McKenna was a cool like psychonaut back then. Right, right. But when you when you run through the gamut and you do all the things and – all the drugs and the parties and the like the searching and you're trying to find this mystical experience that's going to like hit you in the forehead and you'll be forever changed it's not like that no it's a slow germination process right right enlightenment is like a seed that you water <laughs> and you wait and you give it the sunlight right. and like it sprouts and then sometimes it's like that it's slow it's not an instant download and i think people who take these kind of drugs are wanting that um, mystical experience to go. Yeah, they want the shortcut, and, yeah. and enlightenment doesn't have a shortcut, and that's the whole point. Yeah. So I've done them all. I've done all of the yeah. psychedelics and plenty. And when you are in a point in your life where you need help, those things are not going to help you. Right. Like when you're at a dark point at rock bottom. All of this stuff is worthless. Like I owned every book on magic there was. Right. And I still found myself not wanting to live anymore. So that's not, I promise you, that's not the way. Everyone is doing all the cringy things I did when I was in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And they're thinking that this is new and this is the way. And like the, like you said, Joe Rogan and your mushroom bros and all right. of this not the way I promise you. Right. Yeah. There's so many bigger questions and that's where, um, you know, trying to get people to think about their presuppositions. These more, it, it's difficult, but that's the only thing you, to get people to question. I look at, uh, you know, the, the coup 2020 and some of the biggest conspiracy theorists, like in the Gnostic, I mean the, the psychedelic community. So the, those that are really on the frontier that are authors post the Terrence McKenna area era. Um, one of them, um, wrote Daniel pinch Pinchbeck wrote a book in 2020 about the coof and how this, you know, it's being mishandled and all this stuff. And yet at the same time, it's like, you have to go down way more rabbit holes to see that the psychedelic paradigm and the whole counterculture that he's a part of and promoting is tied to the WEF and like this larger phenomenon of dominant like world control. And so it's so interesting to see so many people I know that are sort of still stuck in those places, right? That, that, you know, that you, there's nothing there as you're saying, I've done those things. You're not going to find God there. And you don't people find comfortableness or they find addictions or they find something to just stay stagnant on. And mm -hmm. then they want to criticize. Then the world changes. Things happen. You can feel the zeitgeist changing literally in our culture. And they're wanting, they're wanting to complain about the same thing that in the next sentence, they're also supporting that. And it's all tied together. It's all part of the worldview. It's like Bill Maher right now criticizing the Democrats. And then he's also, you know, still promotes the entire worldview that still promotes transgenderism and all this stuff. Yeah, I know. It's so crazy. And like, <clears throat> I was trying to, in this book, I was just trying to get across that like this, the spiritual world is real. And most of the deep thinkers of the world believe in this magic. <laughs> you know, it's not for stupid people. No, it's not. 
you know what I mean? It's not for dummies. It's for like intellectual people who get concepts and the world. And I was trying to show people like they treat our culture like a petri dish. Yes. And oh, that's a great because point. oh yeah, that's a great image. The culture media, it's called mm -hmm. the petri dish. And so when you introduce different things, you can see this mold is going to grow here or this uh, bacteria is going to grow. And so they just treat society like their own personal science experiment. Right. Basically. Right. right. So then we talk about Tavistock, Hollywood as a new religion, which is kind of um, one of the big points in my live talk that I don't, um, I haven't done any show. All of that stuff is new pretty much. Yeah, so we don't need to get into any of that. If you guys want to see that, you have to go to their live event in Austin, uh, which is yet to be announced, maybe sometime in uh, November. Yeah. So um, Nickelodeon, I don't know if you ever knew that what a Nickelodeon was. No. What's that? Besides a children's TV show, it was um, a form of peep show where what? it had pictures that would like um, – shuffle to to make oh like when they flip the cards and, yeah it looks like things are moving yeah. so you pay a nickel and you see a little lady dancing or whatever so it was uh like your f first you know dirty photo booth or something like that oh so it's a nickelodeon in the sense you'd put in a nickel yeah oh. you put in your nickel and you, and you see um you know pee, pee things oh wow um and then what else Just how television is so creepy. Just the the creation of the cathode ray tube was actually um, by a magician from the Golden Dawn called Sir William Crooks. Mm. And he thought that, that he could communicate with particles on or uh, spirits on the other side. So he made this thing where he thought that the spirits could arrange the particles and he could communicate. So that's where the prototype of television was trying to communicate with spirits. Right, right. And what else? Well, speak, can you say a little something re regarding like how 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 they get Hollywood celebrities to essentially, like you said, be possessed by these sort of we were as Christians we'd call them demons. Um, they call them gods, but in a way, it's like these ancient Babylonian gods. They've never not been here like they're still here with us and and then they literally are able to sort of conduct rituals through the the live performances of many celebrities both male and female mm -hmm. um and maybe we can get next into some of the sexual parts of why all that but go ahead um one thing i was going to add to my talk is about voodoo oh because oh. They <clears throat> make no uh, bones about what exactly they're trying to do. And what I'm saying that has been done in secret society since the beginning, but they play the drumbeat and they make the chants and they make the offerings to their specific gods because they want the god to come into them. I don't know if you've studied the voodoo or watched any kind of I've, documentaries or anything about it. A little bit. Okay, so when the Loa come, the person who selected they pick somebody in the crowd and they possess them and everybody knows that that's exactly what's happening they are possessed by the god ocean or whatever right, right. and now you treat that person like as if you were treating that god you give them their favorite whiskey or you give them yes. their, the bath that they want or their favorite cigar so they they know exactly what the god wants and then they give it to the person so this is one religion that is like you know, barefaced, like, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's yeah. happening. And um, so I'm going to add a part about Beyonce and Voodoo in there because she, in her album that came out in like 2017, the one that when he cheated on her and she made an album, she's very clearly talking about um, her goddess of the water. I can't remember what the name was, Yamaya or Yamaza or something like that. But she's like, I wore all white, which is a voodoo priestess initiation. Uh, she actually said she stopped her flow with pages from the Bible. So that's pretty gross. 
um, and sacrilegious. And she was doing the things that you would do if you wanted to, to be initiated as a, a voodoo priestess. Right. Well, I believe that. And she has an alter personality. She's open about that, too. When she performs, and then like Sasha Fierce or something like she calls herself or something. She has more than one. Um, yeah, Sasha Fierce. And then Yonce was one. Huh. Sounds like um, that sounds like something uh, Kanye would come up with. That's like his new one is, is Yonce. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Beyonce channels Yoruba goddess Oshun. Oshun. Yes. Yes. I believe that. And again, even stopping her menstrual processes with um, scripture. Yeah. Again, is totally indicative of the sort of inversion of the of the phallogocentrism, right? That I've talked about and that Derrida talks about. That you know, when he wanted to undermine Western civilization or the Christian civilization, he said they have to go under the privileging of uh, the masculine, the privileging of logos as a concept of like logic and orderedness and mathematics. Like there's right answers to everything and centeredness. And so they need to stop focusing. Society needs to stop focusing on the majority and start and, and change the centeredness to the marginal so that the marginalities that become the center. And that's exactly what we see in our culture. The attack on the masculine the attack on logic and order to, you know, logos, and then marginality becoming the dominant sort of, I don't know, imagery within commercials, advertisements, society, generally speaking. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, go ahead. And not just that, but there's even a more insidious, like sneaky way they can do with subliminal messages. People love when you talk about subliminal messages because it's something that they can see. But um, I have these in my book, like, here's an old one by Coca-Cola. Can you see in that ice cube what's going on? Oh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. It looks like... Yeah. Um, so uh, it's yeah. so subtle. Um, what's another one? Well, and it's like Disney, right? That there there may, may or may not have been... Uh, sexual toys displayed in certain movie covers yeah i have a whole if you watch the one time i went on alex jones talking about disney and subliminal message we have a whole slew like you can't even argue that's what's going on and even to the point of in the rescuers that movie there's mm. like a actual picture of a naked lady in the, the rescuers. rescuers down under not down under but the rescuers okay I got to yeah. check that out. I remember The Rescuers Down Under. I watched that movie so many times as a kid. But now I got to I gotta go back. I don't even have a VHS. Do you have a VHS player? Mm -hmm. I need to get one. I have all these movies as a kid. I remember Flubber. I remember we used to watch Flubber all the time oh. with Robert Williams. Flubber. Um, so, yeah, Sorcerers and Robots. And then I talk about, like, um, actual physical control of animals. I mean, we're way past this now. Right. I mean, that that's Neuralink, yeah, before yeah. Elon Musk. Yeah. Jose Delgado and those guys, and then, like, how they want to change the Schumann residence, actually, of the Earth. Mm, wow. And how um, music is at the wrong frequency for our physiology right now because it's tuned to 440, and it should be tuned to 432 hertz. Have you heard that conspiracy? No, I haven't. No, tell me. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's basically it. So um, 432, I think, is like the healing vibration. Yes, I've heard that. And like 445 or something. And right now, all modern Western music is tuned to 440. Oh. So it's off. So I, yeah. you can heal yourself with sound or you can hurt yourself with sound. And right now it's designed to be hurting you no matter what you're listening to. I, I definitely believe that. And the there, I saw one presentation of something that was kind of over my head, but it was a classical music artist talking about the lack of melody in music and how uh, it, and it's basically just created music and the music we listen to, it's just, it's just super cacophonous and it's just like no, noises coming together and it's normalizing that sort of discontinence within our minds that it doesn't irritate us where somebody who is more classically trained musician, it'd be irritating to listen to some of the music because it lacks a melody and it's 
sort of chaotic and all this different stuff doesn't connect. Well, it's also attack on God in the way that yes. he spoke creation into existence. Yeah, and that and whole so logos thing. Speech yeah. is a vibration and music is right. speech and vibration. So, yeah. And it's through the um, vibrations and the energy, even as orthodox, that's how we realign with God. Right. Like mm -hmm. being logical and being merciful and being compassionate and being true. These are literal energies that change our energetic vibrations ourselves. Mm -hmm. So then I, I did a fake ad because this is a magazine. Like this was my like little creative <laughs> yeah, project. Yeah. Right. Um, this I did your, like, a, this is a uh, fake Jamie's ad. cosmopolitan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this was in like 2011. <laughs> That's totally so the NPC before, meme. Even before pharmaceuticals became a huge, huge thing, I'm like, everyone's trying to numb out their feelings with Prozac or whatever. But that looks like the NPC. Like, you mean I know. the NPC before the NPC. I know. Well, I do have <laughs> memes in here. Pepe's in here um, because, you know, I'm an internet nerd. Like, I'm a millennial. I, kn I know the memes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm trying to say like they are trying to s stamp out your emotion because your emotion is a, a magical right property and your imagination as well, well and I, speaking on that i think that's partly why the, the again hollywood um deconditionalizes us with the uh violence and so mm -hmm. i've been thinking about again like uh the for example asian people in new york that are getting attacked by generally black people uh serious phenomenon that's happening right now one woman was shoved in front of a subway and was killed by the subway um and you see like there i saw videos of a, of a woman getting beat on the sidewalk and these are older like chinese women asian women and nobody does anything and it's like again through the hollywood through the mind control through the programming through the symbols people are becoming emotionally de desensitized to those things that like transgress the Christian morality. And then mm -hmm. they're becoming sensitive to Christian morality, like being upheld. So whether it be the abortion rights or whether it be, if you speak out against LGBTQ, like now that's like, there's a hypersensitivity in society against those people. And there's a hyper normalization of the violence and the things that sort of transgress our morality. Does yeah. that make sense? Oh, yeah. And desensitizing is a huge part of it. Um, I'm thinking of this thing like mirror neurons. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, mirror neurons. Like, yeah. Like your brain can't really tell what if you're what you're watching is happening to you or happening to someone else. Right. So it's a property of empathy. Um, obviously, we know like something on TV is not happening to us, but your brain, there's chemical processes that do think that like what you've seen, you internalize it right. and it desensitizes you, right? right? And then we're, and then again, like that sigil phenomenon, we're like creating it, right? So we're like creating yeah. the violent societies. We're creating the sexual promiscuity and these, the chaos in society by consuming the images in the first place. It's life imitating art, imitating life, imitating art in exactly. a, like an horrible yes, kind that's of way. Exa that's exactly it. And yeah, so then I wrote this goofy thing um, about like slack magic. Slack magic? Because I was reading a lot of Church of the Subgenius. Do you know what that is? Uh oh. Oh, okay. So, so I gotta look this up too. Church of the Subgenius? Yeah, there, it's a little bit conspiracy, a little bit comedy, a little bit um, just kind of goofy stuff. But basically, their um, deity is called Bob Dobbs who's like this like 1950s um, man <clears throat> who is the embodiment of what they, they call slack. Mm. And so I was like, black magic is bad, but if we just kind of, you know, have faith in it and do good, we can have slack magic. So I was like trying to, because they tell you in magic, you have to think of your own system mm. or you're not a true magician. Right. If you don't make your own magic because you have then, to become your own god your own system your yeah. own cosmology everything right so i'm like i'll make up the thing called slack magic it didn't really <laughs> <laughs> take off and it's this is why um uh, mostly i don't sell it anymore because it's a little sacrilegious but i was trying to use bible verses to draw people in basically because i wanted to open their eyes to the conspiracies so we could just like you know, can we just not have chemtrails and, you know, global government? But <sighs> right. 
Well, I was trying to use everything I could to get people to look at my stuff. Right. No, that totally makes sense. And if anybody were to judge you for that, that's a bit ridiculous. You know, I was in a totally different place. I've said a lot of different things on my journey to orthodoxy. Somebody's like, oh, Jamie, how could you post something like that? I thought you were good orthodox. Uh, oh, yeah. Or, a long time like, ago. I made a video seven years ago. I was talking about a tarot card, and people still today are like, she's a witch. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> I've said in every episode, like, I used to do that, but I don't anymore. Right. Because I was really good at tarot cards. Um, <clears throat> but I also had this idea that, you know, the universe was good and there was a God and that he loved us. And, you know, I didn't necessarily know the details of how you could have a personal relationship with God, but I was, I was vibing on that. Yeah, like, good goodness right, right. <laughs> good versus evil right. i'm on the good side and so i was like i really liked the idea of the fool in the tarot card because you know he just had all this faith and he was innocent and good things happened to him because he didn't know any better right do you know what i mean yeah. and so, like i really liked um forrest gump for that reason right so that's the kind of stuff that i was including in this chapter it's like the good intentioned underdog that kind of gets in his own way and so you're like rooting for him to get out of his own way and yeah or just like somebody who's just like bumbling through life trying to be good and then like good things happen to him and so anyways (sighs) then i got onto psychology and the Mm. psychology of disney Mm. Disneyland and all of their affiliate networks. Like, I don't know if you guys know all this stuff, but like ABC Sports, A&E, Touchstone, Hollywood Pictures, Miramax, Dimension. They've got sports teams. They've got magazines. They've got, you know, Marvel. Even like now they're even bigger than when I wrote this. Oh, I for sure. I mean, now, right? and they've bought up so much. I mean, don't they own like it, 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 when did Comcast and Disney fuse? I mean, because they're now start, like part of the same corporation. Yeah, Time too. Warner. And yeah, I mean, it's like huge now. It's that. a huge monopoly. Right. So that's exactly what I said. Who See, who has the monopoly on life? Is the <laughs> yep. Of what I'm saying. And so I start by talking about Edward Bernays and Freud and psychology and consumerism, mm-hmm. propaganda. And this is the thing. Now we're at a point where everyone's like, late stage capitalism is ruining the world. And it's almost a gaslighting because these people made our culture that way. Right. Especially Bernays in the 20s. And, you know, I'm talking about with the cigarettes and the the advertisement. So they they specifically wanted a creation or. Uh, culture of consumers right and now they have it and now they're saying it's all your fault because you're so greedy and you consume all this stuff when we were literally brainwashed right to do this and now they're saying well look what you've done well and and even telling us that we're bad little consumers yeah they're not telling us to not consume they just want us to consume the products that they want us to consume to control us better so it's that's where the whole like you'll own nothing and you'll be happy it's like Oh, yeah, we, oh, yeah, yeah, we created, and, and everybody, and I always say that, just like you point out with Monopoly, it's like, if, you know, capitalism and communism, communism just starts where capitalism ends, you know, mm-hmm. th- these things aren't like fight competing with each other in the sense that so, so many people think, but, um, yeah, it's like now they are taking away the opportunity to actually own something, so the actual potential, like, beneficial fruits like it's it's biblical to be able to own land it's biblical to be able to farm your own land and grow food and have a house they want to take that away from you so even the opportunity that capitalism was supposed to promise us you know like the the leave it to beaver days where you know you could have a one person working and buy a home and have a family well now they're going to make sure you can't consume any of that stuff but you will consume your your impossible meat uh your vr headset you know the i it's crazy. So it's like the, like your point with the consumerism, they've cre- constructed a, a world of consumerism and then they're just going to make sure that you can't buy all the nice things 
but you're still going to have to be a little consumer sitting in your pod. Yeah, you're going to be a consumer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A coon. That's and perfect. The thing about this, like, is so impractical because anyone who's ever lived past 20 years has gotten some, like, not co common sense just by observing things. And if you share everything and if you rent everything, everything is going to be crappy because the one thing that keeps things nice is ownership. Yes. Right. When you have ownership of something, you like repair it, you yes. wash it, you take care of it. When it's not yours, you trash it, right? The cars are think, a perfect example. Think about all of these self-driving cars or like a self-driving Uber. That's going to smell like piss. That's going to be <laughs> disgusting. It's, I'm serious because people don't own it, right? It's true. It's true. I never thought about it, but I agree like, with you. It's going to be disgusting. Have you ever been on the subway in New York City? It's going it to be, be like, like a public restroom. Yeah, it's going to be a public yeah, restroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy. That's hilarious. Well, I never thought about the, uh, the odors of the self-driving cars, but I'm sure it probably will smell like urine. Because bars. the robot's not going to know if somebody had an accident or threw up in there. I mean, I used to drive Uber, and it's a close call. <laughs> like, at night, you could uh, have people throwing up in there, and then the next person gets in there, and it's going to be puke every... It's just not going to work, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but in this chapter, we talk about the consumer now is the king. And I made this little, like, king baby. Um, because this is the Aeon of Horus. Right? Right. And so every childish desire that you have, you're expected to, I mean, you're expecting the world to fulfill all of it, just like a fat little baby. Right? Right. And... <clears throat> no, I love that. <laughs> I love that because it, it and even with the debt based monetary system, right? So even to if you look at like I watched some of the rich dad, poor dad. So the way that the, the wealthy avoid taxes is they have tons of debt. So if whatever they make that year, they just go buy a helicopter. They, they have to they literally just go buy some. They'll go buy a house. That way they don't pay taxes on the money. Mm -hmm. And so it's like wealth is incentivized to just consume more and more, go more and more and more debt because the, the system itself is based on debt. And so mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like that, key, that little baby image, right? It's like a monotonous, like financial system that reinforces again, the, like the baby consumer that just seeking pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then even from the time that you are a baby, all of this is shoved in your face. So, I mean, there's, from your birth to death, you can't go anywhere without seeing a Disney anything. Right. Right. I can't even, when I first started going to church, I was a little, not judgmental, but I was like, I didn't want to see anything that triggered me. Um, so I, I would go to the, the little Orthodox church and this, there's a little boy in there had a car's backpack and I'd always be like, oh, I don't want to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm in this beautiful sanctuary where I feel peaceful. And then I look over and say, Disney. And I'm like, her, it's everywhere. Right. Because this is like the illusion of choice right. that we find ourselves in a lot of times, you know, Democrat or Republican, Disney, or there is no or anymore. It's right. just Disney. Right. Um, no, it's a, it's a great point. And preying on the children and the pedophilia and the PC culture and the stuff that they normalize. It's, I mean, it is, Disney is like, uh, the right hand of the, of Satan. I mean, you can talk mm -hmm. about the larger corporations or you can talk about gap or, or Calvin Klein's advertisements of the trans dude, I, you know, whatever, but it's the Disney that's so pernicious because of the emotional attachments the children have to the characters. We still do you and I, I'm sure we still like Mowgli from jungle book and, you know, and the rescuers down under from, uh, you know, it's like, I remember yeah. those as a kid, and it's like they still the lying. I remember going to see the Lion King with my mom in, in theaters when it came out as a kid. That was a big deal. I know. Um, the first movie I ever saw was Land Before Time. That wasn't Disney, but that made a huge impact on me. And I wrote about that in one of my chapters about trauma-based mind control. 
about when its mother died, the dinosaur's mom died. Yeah, yeah. I had to go and get the little toy because I, I thought it was an orphan and I had to like <laughs> save it. Right. So this is like the impact that it has on you right. as a little kid. And then when you go to the store back in 2012, I don't, it's not really like this anymore because of the mushing together of genders, but it used to be super um, <clears throat> divided, like blue for boys and pink for girls. Mm -hmm. And everything was princess, like in the 2000s. Right. The just the push for princess and princess stuff was humongous. And then I talk about um, slavery and how there are still modern day slaves. And all of this crap is made in China by people who are working for slave right. wages. Yeah. Right? Slavery still exists in its most legitimate sense in Asia, the Middle East and Africa today. People don't realize. Yeah. Like, and it's the realest well, sense. It's still alive. Who? Who do you think built Dubai and all of those? Right, exactly. Cities. Those are Slave. indentured no. servants, basically. They, it's yeah. all these non, you know, uh, Middle Eastern Muslims, basically. They're mostly like poor people from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I have a quote in here, and it's kind of ironic, but it says, when things become precious and people expendable, that is the horror of the true satanic society. That is when the nightmare begins. Mm. Guess who said that? Good old Anton LaVey. Oh my gosh. I was going to say had, that Disney. He was an interesting character because he had a lot of insights about culture and the way that things go. Right. You know what I mean? Well, the 60s, the 50s and the 60s are so fascinating because so much of the masterminding of what we're experiencing today, like that's where it was really being laid out, like the 50s and the 60s. So to see like their intentions and then laying these things out and then like doing it in society. And then the ripple effect of being in 2022 and how they get that sort of magical blanket has encaptured so many people. It's like, Oh my gosh. And then they think you're crazy as hell when you, when you try, <laughs> when you try to mention it. Well, Madison Avenue is a huge, you know, the whole advertising milieu is a mind control magical operation kind of, you know, getting people to influencing them to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do right. by um, appealing to their insecurities. I mean, that's how they figured out how you sell things to women. Like women, right. they didn't need a lot of stuff back then. They're like, well, let's make them feel ugly. So they'll buy lipstick, right. you know? And then I have all of these, <clears throat> Like you were talking about 50s ads uh, showing like violence against women and just demoralization. Like she has to serve him on her hands and knees and groups of men harassing a woman. Wow. Like these are all ad campaigns, you know, blow it right in her face. It says she'll love you if you blow it in her face. Um, wow. and, and then here's like modern day ones. So they're just dehumanizing women right. and violence stepping on their neck she's not a person she's just a a naked clothes hanger uh all of these she's got a black eye here and, and you know it's, it's so funny let me tie something together the woman the jezebel the babylonian goddess figure the eternal goddess that you mentioned it's like that female though likes that type of sexual activity so she then reifies rem like the, the feedback loop she like glorifies being that sort of sexual product and like choking or violent sex or whatever it may be. So that image of those ads, then it's like the woman that's being walked on or being choked or like being wasted se too sexually seductive. That is actually what young women are like idolizing. And mm -hmm. so now they're instead of like, Oh my gosh, you know this, they're just treating her like a sex object we, you know, say it, you know, they think that it's empowering, but literally they idolize that version of themselves of like, it, which then the men, they become entrapped. And that's where I think, and I wanted to mention this, maybe we can dive into it, the sexuality of all this stuff. I've talked about on this stream before that I think the whole magical spell, the whole thing really hinges on men being able to control themselves sexually. And that if men didn't 
glorify again like t-pain's you know in love with a stripper right this whole like rap phenomenon during the 20s like went from like idolizing the stripper or the prostitute or again like the jezebel figure now we have the cardi b's the Nicki minaj like they're the fulfillment of this sort of archetype already um that men if they could just control their sexuality and like like say no to those type of women like say hey that's not going to be allowed in our society or that's not you know again if we controlled our sex but because again we let the sexual passion like override us now it's like the men want that overly sexual woman the woman who can't be controlled the woman who's you know that just uses her sex to sort of leverage in society and so i i just thought that was so interesting with the the ads that you're showing it's like that's the woman that this is the the program the hollywood program's getting people to want to be and kind of on the point of what you just said, it's really hard for women to respect men when they can't do that. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. So you can't be like, listen to me. I'm your authority. I, you're like supposed to submit to me, blah, blah. When you're so easily controlled by that. Right. Like it just makes their respect go way down. Like how easy is it to get you to compromise you know your morals or whatever um so it's a it's a vicious cycle and it's you know right on target of what the devil likes to see is right. and, and that's why i always use the metaphor that adam was the first simp and so like yeah. creation creation didn't fall when eve ate the apple it was when when adam knowing that he's supposed to follow god did follow his his woman instead and as a sort of just an archetype, I don't mean to take it too far artistically, but um, Adam is an archetype of the man who turns away from God and like pursues the woman to do something he knows he shouldn't do. That is Western civilization. That is the cucking of like the Western man, the Christian man, which is like brought in this entire phenomenon and why then the Babylonian magic out of Hollywood, why like the West is the epicenter of that. And then it, mm -hmm. it's sort of casting its spell across the whole world. Which then those in those other countries, whether it be communist China, can use to their benefit. Because the communist China likes the Hollywood productions when it benefits their propaganda. When it doesn't, they don't let it in. But So it's like all the powers that be that are, again, aren't necessarily Christian but pursuing their own will, they don't mind the magical web that Hollywood casts as long as it works in their favor. Mm -hmm. The new, have you heard the new hot gossip? No, what's that? Of yesterday and today. About? This it. Um, Adam Levine, the singer of Maroon oh, 5. I heard something about an OnlyFans chick like coming out about an affair or something. Tell me about he's it. In, he's in trouble. Well, she came out yesterday on TikTok and she said that they had a affair for a year and he it was over with and then he DM'd her saying, do you mind if I name my baby after you? The baby that I'm going to have. So he's married to a Victoria's Secret supermodel. Adam Levine, Maroon 5, married, is going to have his third baby with the Victoria's Secret supermodel. He DMs this other lady and says, can I name this baby after you? And so she gets on TikTok to expose him. But now it's this whole rabbit hole. Like there's a, a team Adam and a team whatever her name is, Sumner, I think. Because some people don't believe her and some people don't believe him. And then another lady came out and said oh he was flirting with me on instagram too and then now there's four women whoa saying, i did oh, not know i've that. got the receipts of him flirting with me on instagram but there's no proof that he actually had an affair so it's an ongoing investigation oh. into whether he so actually he didn't was sleep just, with the sumner or the the only fans girl we don't know he is denying he's doing the bill clinton thing oh Odd. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just deny everything and see what comes out as provable. Um, but yeah, it's like the cheating is off the charts right now. Right. And, and, and it, that's the point is like a man the, with a Victoria's Secret wife with children. Yeah. Like it's hard for me to understand like how would an OnlyFans chick even be appealing? Well, she's not OnlyFans. She's just Instagram. Oh, she's just an Instagram chick. Oh, for yeah. some reason, some again, I didn't know, but I thought I thought somebody no. said she was like big on OnlyFans or something. It's creating all this dialogue about like, first of all, a cheater's gonna cheat. They're gonna cheat if they're gonna if it's in them. As someone who's not going to cheat is not going to cheat. It doesn't matter who you're married to. It doesn't matter how pretty you are. It doesn't matter how 
fat you are or skinny you are, like, cheaters going to cheat. Right. And a lot of women um, internalize this, like, guilt and shame if they get cheated on. Like, oh, I wasn't good enough, but it's not the person's fault. Like, and you can reverse it, too. It's not the man's fault if she cheated on you. Right. Right. So they're just going to do it if they're going to do it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. But <clears throat> on my feeds, on my, I don't know if it's like the algorithm to me is like being weird, but I just keep seeing so many stories of cheat, 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 cheat. Like everyone is freaking cheating. Right. And I guess it's just the greediness of the culture or like the, the idea that you can just replace somebody like women are like buses. You know, if you miss one, tw one will be around in 20 minutes or I get on Tinder and I can get a hundred women or whatever. Like, no, that's or, a great point. Let me hold on to that. Like you said about buses, um, yeah. because it really is that you say that like that. Cause even the girls advertise themselves like the Instagram girls, like by having the nice boobs and the butt and the small waist and then the heels and the way that she dresses, like she's advertising how appealing it would be to have sex with her. And so then you have like the girls basically presenting themselves as like, well, look at, look at my figure, look at my figure, look at my figure. And so they literally are presenting themselves as like just interchangeable objects to have sex with. And, and like you said, then the men treat them like that. And then everybody has these terrible relationships and everybody's having broken hearts and like getting cheated. It's like, well, I wonder why. Because it, they feel like in their mind that the market is flooded, you know, like saturated with available, attractive people. And that's just not the case. Right. But the illusion by having like Tinder or Bumble or whatever you have, it's that, well, I don't like you. I can just download this and have 10 other people yes. tonight. Oh, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so like the Internet and all of this... Um, Fast food, fast fashion, fast consuming. You consume people just as fast. Right. In that's the modern so true. world. That is so true. And that's, and that's the utility of relationships, right? So it's like people are always constantly using people, which is, again, that sort of futility of the relationship. Well, I just, once I've used you or I've got something from you, it doesn't matter if you're in my life or not, unless you're an asset to me. And that's not what friendship is. That's not like the point of building relationships with people. I keep hearing um, guys say, what do you bring to the table to women? Like, what do you bring to the table? And so it's it's almost like the attitude is only what can you do for me? Right. And then if you stop being useful at any point, then you will be discarded and replaced with something newer, better, faster, more submissive. Right. It's just getting crazy. No, I think I think that too, that rhetoric from men one, it's a way to appear to have a sort of societal leverage or status that, uh, that a lot of, I mean, to be honest, I think one of the hardest things right now is for a young man to have any sort of societal leverage or status. And, and then women, you know, then women are looking at men and, and sort of trying to decipher, you know, who's the best option to bet on long term. And so then I think because of the culture and some of the manosphere and be Andrew Tate or whatnot for good and bad. But it, one of the things for young men is they use this sort of rhetoric um, to demonstrate at least to others or somewhat that they have some side of leverage, you know, Oh, well she's got to do something for me. And, and, you know, that again, that's not, if we're Christian, that's not the point of the relation. You could say that obviously you have standards or something, or you have expectations in one way or another, but to demean relationships or to demean again, somebody just to be a utility for you, like that's not that's not representing something being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're emulating Hollywood in all ways and also in relationship ways. Yes. Oh, this is a great point. Yes. And keep, oh, dive into this. So we all know that like they all cheat on each other and sleep around like it. It's a joke. Like if you're going to date an actor, then you're in open relationship, right. whether you know it or not. Right. Right. <laughs> it's just kind of a given. If he's a rock star, well, he's expected that he's going to step out. Um, and so this trickles down into people's attitudes, I think, in the, the non-entertainment industry because we emulate all of these things because we've been following the stars. And I talk about that 
in one of my books about how we used to use stars for navigation. Yes. And yes, I say the same. For signs, seasons. So we we're following the stars and we still do that today. Only we are following actors and musicians. And yep. I call this Hollywood astrology. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, uh, again, even again with with your research, like with um, Beyonce and all this stuff, like even some of the gods and goddesses are Katy Perry, like dressing up like Ra and the Egyptian symbolism and the Pharaoh or, um, you know, uh, Cleopatra, all this different stuff. So like you said, it's just, it, it, it's the maintaining of paganism. Like it, because of light pollution, we can't see the damn constellation. So you just see Brad Pitt as an archetype for that season or whatever you know because it we're constantly moving through astrological seasons here and the mm -hmm. hollywood celebrities themselves are being presented to to us we're in the house of kardashian right now <laughs> that's right. perfect exactly right which is like fake butts uh it's like again it, it, it's it's all a sort of an imposter um you know, like Kanye West, this man, you know, oh, he's going to get his dream girl. He finally gets with Kim Kardashian, you know, the hottest. Well, then he can't deal with the fact that she became famous due to sex tapes. And according to, you know, a little bit I know that that caused a lot of rifts with him. And he couldn't handle that other rappers would like make jokes about the times that they slept with Kim and Drake or whoever else it is. And it's like, but. Like you, you, your dream woman was totally based on just like the size of her waist, how big that was again, in accordance to her butt, her breast, like how she's perceived by in status and like wearing designer clothes. It's like, bro, like you chose, like you didn't choose a mother. You chose exactly what you got. Yeah. It's very superficial. And I, I don't know who's worse. I think maybe guys are worse at this, um, I, choosing mates on superficial values because it, you guys have a superpower like a beautiful woman like you guys have power over men our rational faculties like stop working around women that we're like attracted to um, i agree with you, you. Know, we're worse. you asked a girl what what are you looking for in a guy and she said oh i want big muscles and you know blue eyes and blonde hair and he has to have like this kind of butt and blah 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 you'd think what a dumbass like why you know right that's but that's totally normal for a guy to it's spit true. off that list of qualifications that what he's looking for he never says uh i would like someone who's kind i'd like someone to be honest someone yeah. with integrity you don't hear that kind of qualifications in today's like guys right agreed no i totally agree mm -hmm. with you and and i think there's a mixture there between um like, I think there's a middle road because a woman's general leverage is her beauty. I mean, there's an aesthetic, there's an, there's an aesthetic difference between a good looking man and a good looking woman. Like both men and women appreciate the good looking woman. There's something about a feminine, a female aesthetic that is just very appealing. And I think that's also why the new age and like art, they use like the goddess, the female, the seductive. There's something unique about the female image. You know, I've heard an Orthodox Christian actually say that God perfected man when he made it the second time with Eve. And that's why then there's an aesthetic beauty to the female figure that doesn't have the same thing with the man. And so a man, he almost is more of a utility. Like he, he, we need to be able to provide, like have a skill. Like men are replaceable things in society. Women are mothers and like... Uh, they're connectors. They bring society together. Women cohere and bring like society together. Women, I mean, men are replaceable. We go to war, we die. We, we go out to tower, you know, climb towers to change light bulbs. Like that's what we do. And so then when men start thinking about a spouse, they can overemphasize the physical beauty characteristics, which is a unique feature of women. But if you're a Christian, you know, her being a mother to your children has to be like, the number one you know like obviously you need to be attractive to her but her values has to be like the number one thing which is going to separate us for, in looking for spouses compared to as you're pointing out the, at the average man who sort of totally lost track on the non-physical things her integrity right mm -hmm. her honesty her kindness that's a big and one is you talk to some of these contemporary girls. They're not nice. Like, like the whole mean <laughs> girls, like this is like girls, like they're not nice. You want a nice woman. 
Well, they used to be until they got all used up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you run out of sweetness. Um, but here's another thing. It's like, it, even if you get past the physical attributes of like what you want in a person, a lot of guys, if you ask them, what are you looking for? Or, or why do you love your partner? Mm -hmm. They'll they'll the list is everything that she does for him. Oh. Um, so are they like, describe your perfect woman and he'll describe, it sounds like a slave. Like, I'm sorry, but it, you know, he, he'll be like, she cooks for me. She cleans for me. She does this. Everything is going to be something in a way that serves him and not her inherent value as a woman, as a person, as a creation of God. Like right. it's just going to be her utility. So you have to be careful, like single guys, when you're searching and when like, think about your criteria and think about like you know you can't just use a person in every way that can be used right and that's not love right right that's that's your sex spot yeah so yeah i think all of us uh need to be careful with um with the the rhetoric we use in regards to dating because you know orthodox dating you would think that it'd be very different from secular dating and to a degree the the upfrontness it definitely is right when you do the orthodox dating i mean it's like okay we just got to figure out like if we're even on page to get married or not but um at the same time we we can't fall victim to the sort of um momentum of our culture and and try to approach relationships and courting in the same fashion because we're not expected to. We're supposed to be doing it in a different way. I want to do a show on this, and it's really about the teleology of dating and coupling and what is even the purpose of it because you're going to do it wrong if you don't know why you're doing it. Right. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I think that's I think that's great, great philosophical language for uh, talking about dating. Yeah, like what is yeah. the telos of you guys even coming together? Yeah, it's got to be because dating the way that we do it now is just a rehearsal for breaking up and divorcing. Right. No, and it's even as and this is something I would agree with E. Michael Jones. Modern dating is is literally based on how gay people interacted and had sexual experiences like in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So they would meet each other in clubs. They would do things in bathrooms or like low key or they would get together. So the whole nightclub like scene of dating, this is all based on homosexual life because before it was about families coming together. So the families had a lot more say in like who you were, who you were going to marry because the whole point was it wasn't just sex it wasn't just pleasure um obviously you needed to be attracted but this was a coming together for the purpose of family and generations and 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 things that are beyond ourselves so the point of marriage is to literally create something that's beyond yourself and i think so many people think of marriage as sort of fulfilling your desires constantly somebody there to fulfill your desires so the man's constantly feeling her desires and she's constantly feeling it and to a degree maybe that's the case but the martyrdom with the orthodox church is like that dying process you're dying to the reality of marriage and what that leads to that's beyond ourselves and that's what makes it meaningful and it's also you know a salvific method yes great point. so what they're bringing to the table is literally like a way for you to live your life in such a way that you will make it to heaven. Right. And that's how you have to treat that person, you right. know, with love and respect and cherishment because that is how you are going to get there when you die. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and that is a daunting conversation to talk to somebody who hasn't already Orthodox or isn't already thinking in that sort of like eternal mindset. Because I agree, it's like you're looking for somebody to like be in eternity with. Because in orthodoxy, like your spouse will be there, God willing, that you both make it to the kingdom. But mm -hmm. we're not we're not Catholic, so you don't just stare at a beatific vision. You know, it's not like you stare at a TV screen of God's analogy for eternity. You get to like choose things, and so theosis is infinite; it's eternal. Our experience in the kingdom, it's like it's endless good 
that you can choose with the person that you still love. So then, so then like making sure you choose the person to marry that you guys are making an agreement for the rest of your lives and, and into eternity. That's not a I lot heard, of topic. I heard a cool thing um, about the word help me as it is in Genesis, like God created Eve to be a help me to Adam. And the way that this person was describing the Hebrew word is that it was as if it's a soldier, like a, a in battle, like mm. your battle mate. Right. I so that. that is how you're choosing. Like God gave men, women to help them in this fight. And she is your like best partner and your protector and someone who's like got your back. You're so all, you know, right. She, she's in the war with you. Right. So, no, I love that you said that because I think that's, that's the sort of ideal, uh, desire I have for a relationship is, uh, you know, doing all this research stuff and just the nature of our work, you know, you and Jay kind of like that. You guys like your skill sets, your passions, your, the gifts and, and really the purpose that it seems like, again, you would know better than I would, but the, the purpose that God's placed for you guys to use your skill sets in a beneficial way for him, uh, that you guys kind of are that coming together and you guys are standing back to back to each other and able to pursue, you know, your interest. And for me, it's like, uh, I, you know, I could get into preferences or physical categories or things about, oh, I want my wife to look like this or have that. It really just comes down to complementing my lifestyle. I know I, I'm doing what God needs me to do and what I'm supposed to be doing. And like the questions I've been asking throughout my 20s, like he answered them. And so now I just have the responsibility to like build this and create content. And like, this is my journey. And, and then finding somebody to do that with. Right. So so then all this other stuff, like you said, the blonde hair or some physical characteristic or it's like that's not as important as somebody who's just like literally can stand like you're saying, like back to back with me and like help me with my thing. So that's like it's not like, you know, just it's a lifestyle, this whole, you know, just diving in, you know, just being there with me. And so then it's like it's more about can you help me? Are you moving in the same direction as I am? regards to like my platform and what I want to do. If not, that's cool. You know, God bless you. Wish you nothing but the best, but that's really what it just comes down to is whether, like you said, you compliment your soldiers together. Are you fighting the same battles together? Like, that's what I want mm -hmm. more than anything that like, what could be more meaningful than that? Yeah. So now we're moving into a phase where you're having to think about, is this somebody who like, I can have as a partner in the apocalypse. <laughs> exactly right. You know what I mean? Like, can, can they chop wood? Can they like do? You know, you, there's all of these variables now that we're moving into the Great Reset, and unknown things are going to happen. It's like it's not as easy as it used to be. Right. So choosing is going to have to be really serious. Like, is this the person that will, like you said, help me fight and get me through this crazy time? So. Right. Right. And that's what we need is meet people that we can fight w together with. I mean, especially in the in the state of the world that we're in now. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much again. We are almost approaching two hours. I can't believe two hours have already gone by. Um, is there you want to is there any more you want to say about the book that before wrapping it up, uh, the book that uh, none of us have the privilege of reading um, before we uh, hop into what these, else was like, in here? It, so I did have a whole thing about Walt Disney in here, like the man, the myth, the um, who was the voice behind the mouse. And so I have like his history, his childhood, his weird um, proclivities. He was not the Uncle Walt that you think he was, just a kind old man who loved cartoons and stuff. This is uh, an military asset working for the fbi working wow. you know close with the cia um <clears throat> demolay not freemason but demolay he had a lot of vices he had a lot of personality disorders um he used to say i only play a character at walt disney that's not who i am oh i've never even heard that quote yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> he didn't know, there's this whole scandal about his birth, is he illegitimate or whatever, so that haunted him his whole life. 
and let him be vulnerable to the government and they that's how they controlled him by saying we'll find your birth parents and stuff like that and i talk about the freemasonic connections and also the military connections um one part is called disney's world of warcraft so that's what we were talking about a little earlier when the Army took over Disney Studios in 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, and like 90% of their production was into propaganda and training films. Um, he worked closely with Nazis like Warner Von Braun. It is Donald Duck who got the United States to start paying taxes. What? Federal income taxes. Oh, yeah. Because they were unconstitutional and nobody was paying them until Donald Duck made this little cartoon. And they said, we need your taxes to beat the axes. And it shows Donald filling out his tax forms and sending in his check. And then everybody got on board to help with the fight against um, Germany and Japan. Wow. How did I not know that? That was one that I was not aware of. Yeah. This one is called The New Spirit. We got to do another stream just on Disney. Like you're talking about like your your presentation you did on InfoWars. Mm -hmm. Like. You tell me the images. I'll download all the freaking images, and we can just go through them and just do a stream, okay. like looking at like Disney images and all the like explicit stuff in them. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, pretty much. Then I just talk about like the economy, um, Bank of International Settlements, and some more symbolism. Oh, maybe next time we can talk about the Mark of the Beast, which is something I found um, that not anybody, if you don't listen to me. You won't know what this is, but the mark of the beast, according to Satanists and Luciferians, is this symbol right here. Oh, really? Yeah. And we can get into the details of that. Who's holding that symbol? <laughs> the Pope? No. Oh, it's Brand. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So... You got super chats to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hit them. Thank you so much for hopping on. That This has been uh, great. It went by super fast. Yeah, it did. Um, okay. First super chat comes from Genghis Khan. Him and his Mongolian whore threw in $9.99. No comment. Thank you so much, Genghis Khan. He's a continual supporter over here. Shout out to you, brother. Greg throws in four ninety nine. No message. Thank you so much, Greg. Keenan throws in 1999 and says for the culture. And thank you so much, Keenan. Shout out to Keenan Beats. Everybody go follow him. His link is in the video description. Show us Jamie's. Go subscribe. Make sure you subscribe over to Jamie's channel. Um, she has Rachel, uh, base homeschool mom, who's in the live chat. She's on there talking about. We didn't even get into Brittany. It's Brittany Batch. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't even get into like I. I get. I had some of this stuff like. Uh, oh well, what do you got on your tabs? I want to know. <clears throat> Well, it was, we were going to get into, I was going to talk about the Babylonian goddess is the eternal goddess and then specifics regarding Brittany, Beyonce, and Katy Perry. Okay. For next time, uh, there's this article that I forgot I even wrote and it was really good. And I was like, I just came across this by Googling an image and I was trying to use the image for something new. And I looked at it and I'm like, this is from my article that I wrote in 2015. Um, and it's called the 2015 Super Bowl Grammy Ritual Spectacular on Freeman TV. So maybe you can read this and we can talk about it next yeah, time. Yeah, that sounds good. But it's got what you're talking about, the goddess, and like how I you know, um, predicted that Katy Perry would do the lion thing in the Super Bowl and everything. So right. Yeah, let's definitely dive into that. And, uh, you know, again, I'd, and I would love to just do one just on Disney because that would be huge. Like if we had an hour, hour and a half of just going through literal images, like because you can do it on Alex Jones. But I mean, they give Jay an hour. But then with the commercial breaks, it's really like 35 minutes. It is scrunched down. So yeah. it's like, let's just have like an hour, hour and a half to literally just go through every image that you have and just do a Disney stream. Like okay. that would be huge. I guarantee you people will be like, what? Because there's no stream that just like all of them together they're right. all there okay yeah we got to do that okay next super chat comes from a change of heart 77 shout out to jessica throws in 499 looking forward to chatting with you tomorrow next super chat comes from 
AJ throws in two dollars and says, "Jamie is a treasure. I heard she is a good singer." Is is the rumor true? Um, I'm not good, but I can. I love music, and I've studied it, and I can sing. So, <laughs> I mean, I can sing in the choir, but when you study something, you feel like you're terrible at it. Um, you know I mean? Yeah, I don't have the con. I am not a singer. I tell you, I wish out of like all the gifts, like you could. I wish that was one of mine. I wish I could sing like just somebody that has that voice and like, and they can just hum and like sing. I, I'm terrible. I'd be, I'm so embarrassed. I mean, by hearing me sing, I can sing, but I can't sing like, yeah, he actually, Jay is better, like natural talent than me. What? So I, yeah. At singing. So Jay's I try to give some him pipes? some lessons. Oh, totally. Yeah. And he makes up all his own tunes and he's a natural singer. I so mean, I, I, I have news. seen, especially this hot summer, 2022 has been a very hot musical summer for Jay Dyer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's got to make a Funko Pop song now. <laughs> That's what I, that was behind behind the the scenes. I got a preview of him mentioning that down at the wedding that. Uh, I guess that was this week. Did he already do that? He mentioned he was going to or. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, everybody, you've heard it here first. Jamie's let it out that Jay has a new uh, late summer hit. This is moving into autumn. You know, again, he's as a true artist, he changes per season, but mm -hmm. he does have a, a Funko pop hit coming for you, for everybody. Next super chat comes from Chad Cass, throws in $5 and says, A plus show. Well, thank you so much, Chad Cass. God bless you, brother. I'm glad that you appreciated it. And again, everybody, give a special thanks to Jamie for dropping knowledge over here for us. And then Brian Richens throws in $5 and says, Great stream, guys. Jamie was a great guest. You're a big hit over here, Jamie. Thanks. Uh, next super chat comes from Hosu Garza throws in $10 and says, great stream. What we see is just illusions. What they show us is just mirages and their intentions for us. Follow us like shadows. They even try to take control of our subconscious minds. Jesus Christ is the truth. We need to break through the satanic, um, mess messiah. So uh, I think it's supposed to be Mirage, the satanic oh. Mirage. Uh, that just, that just reminded me that in magic, um, glamoring is not actually a good thing. So to glamour someone is to, like he said, make a mirage, a synthetic reality, yeah. pulling the wool over someone's eyes. Like this is a magical technique that sorcerers would use. Um, <clears throat> so you have like glamour magazine you have a glamorous movie star glamour glam glamour that's not actually a virtuous thing to yeah. be glamorous no I, that is a great point i never even thought about that but the <clears throat> the sort of over characterization of these sort of public personas is a way again of, of a perception manipulation in the first place uh i mean it's makes sense but you don't really think about the media apparatus and then Medea, like again, in an ancient God goddess, you know, again, like you look at her, you turn to stone. It's like the media is constantly presenting us with these sort of false images that, that it sort of in a way sort of turn us into stone, lock us up, turn us something other than human, making us non-human, I guess would be the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shout out to Hosu Garza. Thank you for the $10 super chat and great point, brother. God bless you. Uh, we absolutely have to realize that they're just illusions. They're mirages um, and the intentions, uh, their intentions for us follow us like shadows. They take control of the subconscious mind. Next super chat comes from Veronica throws in $3 and Veronica says, quick update. I've started catechism classes. Well, sh congratulations, Veronica. God bless you. Uh, Veronica is Kingdom Kid here in our live chat. Her and her son had been inquirers into orthodoxy for a while. And so we've been encouraging her. And she went to her first service probably a couple months ago. She was asking, you know, how do you go about what to expect? 
and now she's a catechism. Congratulations, Veronica. You, you and the family, what a wonderful thing. She says, um, awesome stream. I'll need to rewatch from the beginning. More of this, please. Well, absolutely, Veronica. God bless you. That's wonderful to hear that you and you and the family are uh, your home. You're welcome into the Orthodox Church. As soon you'll be baptized, but at least you've got your foot in the door. You know, God forbid anything were happening here, you're still making it to the kingdom. We got you. So, uh, yeah, congratulations, Veronica. That's excellent. That's so exciting. Uh, next super chat, and this is the last super chat we have, is from Sunrise22, throws in $3 as well and says, do y'all remember the Tootsie Forum, Temple of Screaming Electron, or shroomery.org? That's where I got some of my first red pills a decade ago in my new age phase. Great show, exclamation mark. Are you familiar with the uh, Temple of the Screaming Electron? No, I never heard of that. Is that like a psychedelic thing? I don't know. I'm not familiar with Temple of the Screaming. I am uh, familiar with shroomery.org. Uh, it was basically a forum where people could talk about like trip reports, which drugs they've taken, if they actually made their own, like what they did. Um, but I'm not familiar with Temple of the Screaming Electron. But it mm. sounds like it'd be something. It sounds like something Dennis McKenna is probably associated with. Um, so, uh, but he says, that's where I got my first red pills a decade ago in my new age phase. Great show. Well, thank you so much. Sunrise 22, whoever you are, you're a first time super chatter. I've never seen that name before, but, um, again, glory to God that, uh, you found some red pills on your psychedelic forum. And now you're here watching me and Jamie in 2022 talk about Babylonian whores and Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Jamie, is there anything else you want to say? Again, I got your, uh, I got your YouTube. Uh, do you have an Instagram? Are you on some of the other social media? You kind of have a low, a low profile online. I know. I just don't like it. Like it's probably good. It's good for your mental health for sure. I'm. A, I do have a channel on YouTube. Um, which is in the video description. Everybody can click that. Yeah, it's just search it under my name, Jamie Hanshaw, and it's called Out of This World, and it's my first solo. Uh, show it's or been, it's that, been, that I am yeah. the host of. So and you're doing I, great. You're doing great. For 15 I, years, and this is my first, you know, time on my own. So well, it's great. You're already up over 4,000 subs. Everybody, go subscribe to Jamie over there. And I caught uh, some of you and Rachel. Uh, fascinating stuff. Again, I love I love the topics you guys talk about. I caught a little bit of you guys talking about Brittany. Breaking down the whole Britney Sia, or not her as a Sia, but her being really MK Ultra. But um, yeah, Rachel, her research is so amazing. It's you know scares me. I don't want people coming after me, but like, <laughs> it's that good and deep. Um, but I also have a meeting with an insider who knows the Spears family. Ooh, and he's got some tea for me. There you and go. So me and Rachel are going to do another show soon with some updated information because poor Brittany, she has said she's going to be an atheist now because of the way her family has treated her. She used to believe in God, but she doesn't anymore. And she and went through like a that. quick, like, uh, like I thought Mel Gibson or something like reached out to her and she was like Catholic for like a few days or something. Or uh, there was like a yeah, brief period was... there recently where Mel Gibson like told her she needed to become Catholic. Yeah, they did have like a vacation together, I think. Mel Gibson and Brittany. Um, but well, what do you think of Mel Gibson? He seems like, uh, again, I don't know the insides like you and Jay do of Hollywood, but he seems like uh, one of the few like normal guys in Hollywood. Is that is that he totally seems off? Or? Based. I mean, ca yeah, Catholic is. And he's like know, said not, he's basically set of a contest at this point. Like he's so like anti Frank and the Vatican. I will be disappointed if I hear any scandals coming from him because I, I always know. thought he was like a good, you know, he did movies like Braveheart and Patriot, Patriot. And like hero movies that the, the hero had the virtues and the loyalties and like, so if anything comes out about him, I'm going to be really disappointed. People in the chat are saying Mel has said good things about orthodoxy. Okay. 
So, hey, that's a step in the right direction. That's a step in the right direction. Well, Jamie, I don't, I apologize for keeping you this long. We mentioned uh, doing it a little bit shorter than this, but time got away from us. That went a lot faster than expected. We got to do another one on Disney. You kept talking about Disney. That's going to be a phenomenal stream. Uh, if you want to do one on the article you mentioned to get maybe a little bit more into sort of the sex and the pagan stuff, we can do that one as well. Shoot, we can do another stream. We got multiple stream topics prepared, so uh, I would love to do that. There's so no rules on streaming. We can do it all. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, you again so much. Um, really appreciate it. Is there anything you want to say before hopping off here? Um, no, just go check out my uh, YouTube shows. I work really hard on them. They're not just off the cuff. They're really like I go into notes and study and I try to bring something brand new that no one's ever heard before in each show. So I don't like to repeat myself. Excellent. Yeah, guys, go click that link in the video description. Um, I will be back tomorrow with a birthday stream. Tomorrow I turn 33 years old. So we'll do a bit of a birthday call-in stream. So I'll see you guys tomorrow evening. Again, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me. We got to do it again soon. This was a lot of fun. So See y'all later. Have a wonderful night.